The title of our message today, we are jumping back into a teaching series on the book of Revelation. Woo! Okay, we got like some apprehensive woos at the valley. That's okay. We're jumping back into Revelation, and today's title is Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse Now. Uh, if I had a backup title, I would call it Then I Saw the Lamb. I want to start out with a statement. I want to say a statement to you and just kind of frame our time together today up with this. And I want to just give a, maybe actually a preamble before I give my statement. This is time to lean in. It's time to open your Bible. It's time to get notes out. We're going to do the deep dive. Are you ready to do that today? We're going to actually dive in and we're going to study the Word. And it's got some things to say to us that I think are going to, we're going to find very, very encouraging. But just hang with me. So here's the statement I want to just submit to you today. And it's this. The biblical apocalypse, the one that the Bible talks about, the apocalypse of Revelation, the biblical apocalypse is happening now. It's actually happening. It's been happening, it is happening, and it will continue to happen. The biblical apocalypse is happening now. However, it might not be what you think it is. Why don't you keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that. Here, let me ask you a question today, wherever you are. Have you ever missed the point of something so dramatically and so badly that you actually took it in the wrong direction entirely? Like you didn't just kind of miss the point. You actually appropriated it in the exact wrong direction that it was originally intended for. Have you ever done that? Like maybe it was with a joke. Someone told you a joke and you got it like the total wrong way. Or perhaps maybe someone uh, complimented you and you took it as an insult. Has anybody ever done that? Or maybe you're like me and someone insulted you and you took it as a compliment because you got swag like that. I don't know, that's a better way to do it. But have you ever, or maybe this, I see this on Facebook a lot. Have you ever like totally misapplied a concept? I see this with grammar. Any grammar nerds out there? We need to do a tutorial on YouTube and post it on Facebook to help people know that there's a difference between a part and a part. My grammar freaks know what I'm talking about. Some of you are out here so good to be a part of this. And the, the word you use actually means that you're not part of it anyway. I don't have time for that. Have you ever been so wrong, that, like, like so off on a concept that it, ironically you took it in the opposite direction from its original intention? I want to suggest to you today that that's what we do with the book of Revelation. That in fact, this book that God gave us, the, the, the last book in the New Testament, the last book in your Bible, in the canon of Scripture, I want to suggest to you that we might have taken it the exact opposite way from what it was originally intended. And for a few minutes, before we jump into today's text, and you can turn to Revelation chapter 5, because that's where we're going to end up, I want to just sort of unwind and reset what you think Revelation is all about. And I want us to see it the right way and take it the right way, because if we don't, we're not going to be able to see what it wants to show us today. We have been missing the point on the book of Revelation. It's interesting to think that a book called Revelation is the most confusing book in the Bible. Has anybody ever stopped to think about that for a second? Like either the, the author and the title is really jacked up or we're missing something. Like it's interesting that this book that was called, it is called Revelation is so confusing and it causes so much speculation and so much conjecture. It's caused confusion and concern. And in fact, it's caused fear in a lot of believers. I remember talking when we did round one of Revelation. This is Revelation Reloaded. We're on round two but round one, I remember talking to some parents and they have a young adult daughter who's like, I'm not coming to church while he does Revelation because I'm scared of what's in it. And I think that's actually more common than we may realize that we have read this book and it's caused fear and confusion. However, we learned last time that right in the beginning of the book, in chapter one, John, the, the apostle who wrote the book, he was isolated. Talk about having a new definition of isolation now in round two. He was isolated on the island of Patmos, and he wrote this book as a revelation. Jesus Christ showed up, the risen Christ showed up, and he tells us, he, he, he gives us instruction. He says, here's why I'm writing this book. He gives us the purpose right out the gate. He says, I'm writing it so that you will be blessed and you will have grace and peace. He said, that's the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book of Revelation is for your blessing, for your grace, and for your peace. 
That's what this book is all about. Now, the question has to be ringing in some of your minds. Well, how did a book that's called Revelation become the most confusing book in the Bible? And how did a book that was purposed for blessing, grace, peace, and life become something that is so devastating, destruction, and fear-causing? Have you connected those dots yet? And that's the question you should be asking. And I actually think it comes back to misinterpreting what the book was all about. Even in the title itself, we have hijacked the meaning. The word revelation, if you were with us in round one, the word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. And apocalypsis is where we get the word what? Apocalypse. Yeah, it's where you get the, 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 the English word apocalypse. And it means in Greek, however, the word apocalypsis means unveiling. I heard someone already say it. It means to remove a veil. It's about showing you something that you hadn't seen before. That's what apocalypsis means. However, over generations of interpreting the book of Revelation, we have attributed the word apocalypse to mean what? Destruction, chaos, wrath judgment, gnarly beasts and whores of Babylon, all kinds of craziness is in there. And we've actually made the book, the word apocalypse, we've actually redefined the word apocalypse in the English language to be about destruction when the word apocalypse actually is about vision. And so the next time you're watching CNN, which I wouldn't recommend, but the next time you see, you see a, a reporter in the field in a hurricane and he's hanging on to a post and he's saying back to, back to Bruce Frisco at the station, he's saying, it is apocalyptic out here. And then the cat walks by just perfectly fine. But the next time you hear them say that word, apocalyptic, they're, they're, you can say, you can at them on Twitter and say, you're using it wrong. Apocalypse means to see. And having an apocalypse is having a vision. It's being able to see something that you couldn't see before. It is to unveil something that had been shielded from your eyes. And so the purpose of the revelation or the apocalypse is so important, hang with me, is to show you that things are not as they seem and that there's more going on than meets the eye. And what this book is trying to do is to help you see beyond the veil of this temporal, physical existence into the eternality of heaven and realize there's much more going on than what you may think. Now, the reason we get lost in this book is because of the imagery. It's what is known as apocalyptic imagery, apocalyptic literature. It's a type of language. It's a type of communication. Now, in your Bible, if you open your Bible, there's a bunch of varieties of, of communication forms. There's history. There's typography. There's genealogy. There's poetry. There's artistry. There's even a play in here. And then there is this one category called apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature. And what it is is imagery. The closest thing that you and I have to apocalyptic literature is movies. It's actually taking an image which communicates not one word, but how many? A thousand-ish, right? A picture's worth a thousand words. That's what this is all about. And many of us, when we read it, we start to read the image and we try to envision the image and we're missing the point. The image is pointing to something greater. So it's this imagery we've got to understand. Now, here's the big point. Before we jump in, I'm going I'm to fly through Revelation 5, and it's going to blow your mind as it has mine. But here's the point you need to understand before we jump into Revelation. The purpose of Revelation is to unveil the truth of reality. It is to help you see what you are currently not seeing, both now and to come. Revelation is an unveiling, an apocalypsis to reveal what you weren't seeing before, to show you what was, what is, and what is to be. It was not given to cause fear or speculation. It was given to bring revelation, cause for celebration because of God's great blessing and what he is doing, has done, and will do on the earth. That is the book of Revelation. So we have all the reason in the world to lean in and get very excited about this book. So Revelation chapter five, just to catch everybody up. Are you with me? Valley location. Wes, are you awake? You with me? Here we go. So Revelation 1, we find John. He sees the risen Christ. Go back and check it out. I would encourage you to go check out some of those messages. He sees the risen Christ. He has a revelation of who Jesus is, the resurrected Jesus. And then in chapter 2, 
Jesus says, I want you to communicate seven letters to seven churches. We found out last time that seven is not just a numeric value, but again, it's an image. It speaks of the completeness, the totality. Seven in the Bible means total, total. And so he says, send these letters to the seven churches. All the churches of all time send these letters. And we did that. We went through every letter, chapter two, chapter three. Then in chapter four, something amazing happens. So the letters, the letter, the addresses to the churches happen. And Jesus then says to John, come with me. I want to show you this before I show you what must take place. And so right now we are in the middle of a vision. Chapter four, the Bible says, I saw before me a door open, an unveiling. And we entered through the door. Now, mind you, we did not go up. We did not ascend to heaven. We entered through the door. And when we entered through the door, John says, I saw the throne of heaven. He has a vision of God. And I wish we had time to go in and look at it in chapter four. We preached on it at length. We talked about it. And we, it's incredible how it scopes in and fills in our theology of who God is once we start to understand the imagery. And he has this picture of God. He sees Heaven, and now remember, it's not some other place, some other time. He literally stepped from Patmos through a door and saw another reality. And so he's seeing the throne of heaven and he's relaying what he saw. And now we find in chapter five, here we go, the camera zooms in. So first he sees in chapter four, he sees God on the throne and he sees around the throne. There's a sea of glass because the sea is calm. Chaos is calm in the presence of God. He sees it encircled by a rainbow, which is a sign of grace. Even entering the throne, it's a throne of grace, which we're gonna see even in more detail today. And he sees that he's surrounded by 24 elders, all the authority of of mankind surrounds him and four living creatures, which represent creation, are right before him, worshiping him. And now we zoom into the throne. Are you ready? Revelation chapter five says this. Now, I want you to read this out loud with me. If you remember, it says in the beginning of the book, blessed is the one who reads this out loud, who hears this and who obeys it. So let's get that triple blessing. You want the triple blessing? Yeah, okay, good. All right, Wes, you too. Here we go. It says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Let's stop there and let's start to unpack this. We're going to unpack the Bible because I don't want to just fly over things that mean so much. And so it says, John, the camera zooms in on the throne. And now it doesn't just see who's sitting on the throne, but it sees what's in his right hand. He has a scroll. Now, this is not official heavenly scroll, um, but it says he has a scroll in his right hand with seven seals. What does that mean? Now, first and foremost, when you start to try to interpret the scripture, you begin with the original context. You begin with the fact that John was writing in about 96 AD to some real people who were Christians trying to live the life of faith under the thumb and under the boot of the Roman Empire who was actually persecuting them mightily at the time. And so it says there was a scroll with seven seals. What's that about? What are the seven seals and what's the scroll? Now let's break it down. It says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, who's on the throne? God's on the throne. But what's this about his right hand? What is the right hand and why does that matter that it's in his right hand and not his left hand? The right hand is the biblical hand of power. Dextera domini. Fun word. It's, it's, it's the representation of the will, the power, the might, and the capacity of God. So it says in his right hand, there is a scroll with writing on both sides. So you get this scroll that is a comprehensive scroll. There's stuff inside and out of it. It's an eternal scroll. It's an infinite scroll. And for the original audience, they knew what scrolls were. Now, we don't communicate with scrolls, do we? We text and do emojis. They, when they wanted to record something valuable, it was done on a scroll. And these scrolls for them were multiple things. It would have spoke to the prophetic words of the Old Testament to the scrolls of Isaiah, the promises of God. It would have spoke to the history and lineage of Israel. It would have spoke to the, to the scriptures that have been rolled up over the ages. But not just that, they would have pictured more than just biblical scrolls and biblical history. It was a representation of history, but it's more than that. They maybe would have pictured a commander 
in the right hand of a general as a battle plan. Maybe they would have pictured an engineer, a developer, someone who's got a schematic of something they're creating, a blueprint in the hand, in the right hand. This is the picture. The scroll is a picture of the destiny, the desire, the will, the declaration, the prophetic words of God, and the design and the history of all creation. It's a pretty incredible thought that in God's right hand is his perfect will, his design, the destiny of all creation. This represents, the scroll represents God's good, perfect will and intention for all of humanity and all of creation. That's incredible. Imagine being able to look on that scroll. Now, let's pause here for a second and let's let this speak to us. What is one thing that it's trying to say to us? Well, it tells me something that God is still on his throne and he still holds the future, he holds the past, he holds the present, that you know, John would have been surprised or maybe encouraged to know that Nero did not come in and start to pry from God's hand the deed of the universe. Amen? Amen. Isn't it good to know that God has a plan? It says, then I saw a scroll. Here's what you need to see first and foremost in Revelation chapter five. You need to see that God has a plan. And I know sometimes we throw that around. If you grew up in church or you went to youth camp, you've heard God is good and he has a wonderful plan for your life. You know what? Sometimes we say things a lot because they matter a lot. God does have a plan. God is on the throne and Nero isn't bringing that into question. This, the, the Roman Empire isn't bringing that into question for John and the early Christians. Coronavirus isn't prying this out of the hand of God. The economy, Trump or Trudeau, none of these are pulling this out of God's hand. God is high above it, and he has a predetermined will, a desire to see unfolded on the earth. What, a, what an incredible picture. You know what? Your life's in this scroll. God's desire for your life, for your family, your legacy, written in the pages of the scroll. How God's designed you to operate and flourish, written in the pages of the scroll. Uh, and I think the, the early Christians would have had this amazing moment of, oh, God has not lost control. And the best thing that could ever happen on the earth is that scroll getting unfolded and the perfect plan and will and order and design of God being fleshed out on the earth. That would be the best thing that could ever happen. That's what the first Christians would have, would have assumed. That's what, they, that's what they would have taken from that. Seeing the scroll in the right hand of God would have meant immediate, immediate hope. Immediate hope when you see the throne. Now, here's the question. The question is, how is the scroll going to be worked out in our lives on the earth? That's the question. Now, it says something. It says that it was sealed with seven seals. Now, what's a seal? Not a, not a seal. Seven seals. Like back in these days, back in the first century anyway, they, uh, a dignitary, someone with power, would indicate that this was from them, not only that it's from them, but it's for a certain type of person that can open it. The seal represented who was able to open the seal. And now it's significant that it wasn't just sealed once, it was sealed seven times, completely sealed up. That, there, that is completely sealed up. And now watch what happens next. So this, now you're already painting the picture. God has a perfect plan and a perfect will, but it's sealed up, it's rolled up. It's in his hand. And then watch what happens next. It says, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice. So I saw the one, the one on the throne and in his hand was a scroll. And then I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break or open the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept. Now, I thought Seth, Pastor Seth did such a great job a few weeks ago talking about how, you know, the Bible didn't have emojis and it didn't use like 10 exclamation points. What it would do is use the same word twice to show you how intense that is. I looked up the Greek and, and here this wept is like bitter wailing. I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll inside. Now, now why is John weeping? Why is John weeping? Because have you ever had your hopes dashed? 
Have you ever had your hopes like at an all-time high? Like some of you, you don't want to get your hopes up because you know the feeling of having your hopes crashed down to earth, right? That's the moment that John's in. He has this simultaneous thing happen. He sees the throne. His mind is being blown. It's, God has a plan and it's firm in his hand and yet he realizes that it's, it's, it's wound up. It's closed, it's sealed, and then this mighty angel, not just any angel, a mighty angel says, who can open this? We're stuck. We're stuck. God has a will, but it's sealed up. And he has this moment of devastation where he weeps and weeps because no one is worthy in heaven or on earth to open the scroll. John in this moment sees, here's the next thing I think this points us to, there's a great problem that the universe faces, especially like this, this place we call earth. There is a great problem. God may have a will, a good and perfect will, but all of us who have lived in this world long enough realize that, man, there is some gnarly, chaotic, awful things. Like, life is very hard. Has anybody lived long enough to figure that out yet? And if you, if you, don't, if you think this world is just like, you know, sunshine and lollipops, you have not lived very long and you are still in a delusion. John has like that moment of realization that like, oh man, this is hopeless, this is absolutely hopeless. He has like this nihilistic moment. Anybody like ever have one of those moments? You know, like uh, some, of you, some of you guys maybe had a midlife crisis where you just hit a wall. And it's like, you know what? I'm 50 years old and I've accomplished nothing. And the things I have accomplished didn't satisfy me like I thought I would. I'm not having blah, blah, blah. And you just kind of have this nihilistic woe is me moment. That's what's happening here. He's having this moment where he's just struck with the weight of despair, realizing that God has a perfect will, and yet we're stuck under the reality and rule and reign of chaos, sin, Nero, persecution, coronavirus, job loss, economies tanking. We're stuck under this. This is what was going on. This is the great problem of life. You know, I want to, let me just kind of go off the rails here for a second and just say, I actually, this might not be a popular opinion, but I actually am surprised how optimistic people who don't believe in Jesus actually are. Like, I honestly don't know how you get up in the morning. Life is so hard. This world is so brutal. And I mean, joy in this life is just temporary. It's here and then it's gone. I know some of you are like, wow. <laughs> Thanks, pastor. No, seriously, like short of the grace and reality of Jesus, which we'll talk about in a second, like, you need to know something, that you are doomed for destruction. Like, have you ever thought of the second law of thermodynamics? Of course you have. Entropy. How depressing is the fact that they say it is law, that things that were ordered are going to deteriorate and disintegrate into destruction. It's physics. Destruction is physics. That should make you weep. Loss. It's part of this existence we have. And John just has this moment where he's like, I thought for a moment, I thought for a moment there was going to be one who was going to bring order to the chaos and life to the death and righteousness over the sinfulness in my life and all around me. And yet there's an eternity between us and his, in his right hand. There's infinity between me and him. Notice that it said, let me go back for a second. Notice that it said there was no one in heaven or on earth. No one in heaven. Why, why could nobody in heaven exact God's will? Why was no one in heaven worthy? Now, when the scripture says worthy here, it's really important that you know, like when we think of worthy, we think more title. The scripture is more speaking of, of ability, of authority, of capability. Like I was thinking about how, you know, if maybe we were all on a deserted island and it was going up in flames, this is like crazy, right? It, and we're like trying to get off the island and there was like a perfect Boeing 747 with a runway. That's great. But if there's no one who is able to fly the plane, we're all screwed, right? That's kind of what this is speaking to. When there's no one on, in heaven, there's no one who's able, who's worthy. Now, why is, why is the mighty angel not worthy? Because if you go back and you read Genesis, you find out that God actually put the, 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 the authority of creation in the hands of men that if there's going to be redemption and reconciliation, it's going to have to come through a human being. 
Because we bear God's image and God has given us the authority to work his will out on the earth. So somebody is going to have to have the capacity to be able to open these seals. Someone's going to have to be strong enough to reach the right hand of God, holy enough to approach the all-consuming fire that is God, and intelligent enough, all-knowing enough to be able to open it and understand what's inside. That's what this is speaking to. It's speaking to the gap between heaven and earth the gap between us and God, and the fact that we need a mediator. We need somebody who bridges heaven and earth, who is fully holy, spotless, who has never sinned. Sin can't touch the right hand of God. Who has never failed, who is fully God and fully man, and this is where it starts to get exciting. So we see the problem. You got the problem? The problem is what? It's sin. It's separation. We are stuck in sin. Sin isn't just the bad things you do. Sin is the chaos and disaster and dysfunction. Sin is the second law of thermodynamics. It is entropy. That is what sin is. It is destruction, having its way, lording itself over us. It is dominant. But then look what happens. Then one of the elders said to me, I want you to say this out loud. Do not weep. Say it again. Do not weep. Can I just just give you an aside for a second? This is actually the heart of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, three different times at three different strategic places, it it deals with the tears of humanity. Revelation chapter 5 right here. Revelation chapter 7, it gives a picture of the redeemed. And it says that Jesus himself wiped every tear from their eyes. This book is not about this book is not about crying. It's about the end of tears. Whew. Revelation 21 says that in the end there is no more crying, no more mourning, no more sorrow, no more tears. Do not weep is one of the great invitations of this book. That's just an aside. Now let's keep going. He goes, "Do not weep." See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has is triumphed. And he is able. He's smart enough. He's capable enough. He's powerful enough. He's holy enough. He's heavenly enough. He's earthly enough to open the scroll and it's seven seals. He is the one who can unfold the great and perfect will of God on the earth. This is getting really good. He says, don't weep, don't weep. Now, the early, early Christians, they would have known immediately what this is speaking of. This is not trying to give you a picture of a lion or a picture of a root. It's speaking about a someone. It's speaking about Jesus. It's speaking about a person. It's speaking about a promise. If you read the book of Genesis, you'll find out this this lion of the tribe of Judah. Did you know that God, right from the beginning, that from the beginning, God had a plan to deal with sin and destruction and chaos? This was not some, like when sin happened, I know some of us read the book of Genesis and we're like, okay, sin happened, and all of a sudden, like, God gets into react mode. Okay, what are we gonna do now? That's actually not what was going on here. Part of the plan was that God was going to unfold a redemption process by which he redeems his creation and wins them over with love and passion and power. And we'll get to that in just a second. But this is speaking about Jesus. Who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? It's Jesus. Who is the root of David? The true king of Israel. It's it's Jesus. And, And now he says like, it says, John heard. It didn't say I saw at this point. I just don't miss that. It says, the angel turned to me and said, or the elder turned to me and said, look, remember the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Remember Jesus. He's heard of Jesus. And then it turns to the most beautiful sight he ever saw. So have in mind the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it says that John turns. So it says, don't weep. The Lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. And then it says, then I saw not a lion, a what? A lamb. I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. So this this lamb had been slaughtered, yet it was alive, standing at the center of the throne. So as the camera zooms in, he sees that the one who's sitting on the throne 
is actually a lamb, not a lion, and he is in the center of the throne in that whole incredible heavenly eternal scene that we saw in Revelation chapter 4 with all the angels, the myriads of angels, and the 24 elders and the living creatures. They're actually circling around the lamb. It says the lamb's at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. And the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. Now, don't get lost there. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Seven horns and seven eyes. So John turns and he sees a lamb. This is where this gets so exciting. Now, the first Christians, the, the, the root of David, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb that was slain, that's bringing up atonement imagery. It's bringing up Old Testament, like Leviticus. They would would actually slaughter a lamb to know that they've been made right with God. And now this is speaking of what? It's speaking of Jesus, the lamb of God who came, took on our sin, died in our place, was slaughtered, on a cross, he died. He actually bore and absorbed death and sin in its entirety on the cross. And I think this is just so important that we understand something, that the lamb is actually the one that's on the throne. It's the lamb that was the plan. The lamb was the plan all along. It actually says in John, John one twenty nine. I love this, John, John, the same, we think the same guy wrote this, talking about John the Baptist saying, look, the Lamb of God, talking about who? Talking about Jesus, look at the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's that atonement. Then Revelation, same book says, it tells us the Lamb was slain from the creation or the foundation of the world. That means that God knew that we would fail. That means that God knew that we would fall short of his glory. That means God knew we would need mediation. That that means God knew we would need vindication and reconciliation. And so he put into motion the most perfect plan. It was the lamb. The lamb was the plan all along. Now, what was that talking about? It was talking about like seven eyes. Let's go back. Uh Uh-oh. It was talking about seven eyes. And I want to go back just a sec. It said it has seven eyes and seven horns. What is that all about? Well, seven is what? It's complete. It's perfect. It's full. What are the horns and what are the eyes? The eyes represent what? The eyes represent vision, but more than that, it represents understanding, omnipotence. The lamb is all-knowing, and the lamb has seven horns. What are seven horns? The seven horns represent In in that day, they represented royalty and supreme might. It wasn't just one horn, there were seven horns. So what's the seven-horned, seven-eyed lamb? What's it a picture of? It's a picture of Jesus who is perfect in power and perfect in knowledge. He is the one who is worthy to open the scroll. The lamb was always the plan. The lamb was always the plan. So let's, let's finish it off because here, here's where it zooms in. The lamb then went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. What's that mean? It means, again, the lamb was the plan that, that Jesus, through laying down his life, was exacting and enacting the will of God on the earth. That God intended to lay not just to, to, to put his, our sins on ourselves, but it says in Isaiah 53, he put the sins of us all on himself. That's the plan. It says, and when he taken it, the four living creatures. So he goes over and he takes the thing. And when, the, when he taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Then it says this. It says, each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. You see this shift in the heavenlies. And John gets a vision of it where Jesus takes his seat on the throne of the universe and all of heaven turns toward the lamb. And then you you start to see all the earth turn towards the lamb. And next week we'll get into it a little bit more where all of a sudden you see heaven worshiping the lamb. You see the elders worshiping the lamb. You see the earth worshiping the lamb. You see humanity worshiping the lamb and everything points to the lamb. This right here, The vision of the lamb slain is the apocalypse. That's what Revelation wants you to see. On the throne of the universe. Let me say it like this. Some of you are getting lost. Let me just 
zoom it in. On the throne of the universe, it says in Revelation, there is an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-worthy lamb that was slain for you. Let's, let's zoom it in a little more. On the throne of the universe, the lamb, Jesus, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty, all good, who laid his life down for you, is on the throne of the universe. Grace is on the throne of the universe. Grace is on the throne of the universe. Unmerited favor is on the throne of the universe, flowing forever from the throne of the universe is the goodness and power and might of God. Not a lion who overlords, but a lamb who lays his life down and he's begun a revolution. That's the point of the whole book. There's a great proclamation that this makes. The apocalypse makes a claim that Jesus rules, that grace rules, grace reigns. Like somehow we've made the book of Revelation about judgment and the whole point of Revelation chapter five is that God's mercy triumphs over judgment. That's what the whole thing's about. And you know what? In the next coming weeks, there's some crazy stuff that happens, but it's all flowing from the lamb and it's pointing people back to the lamb, calling everybody unto himself, every person from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation back to the lamb to be reconciled and restored and brought to life forever and ever and ever. That is the invitation in the book of Revelation. That is the point. That is the apocalypse. The apocalypse is now. The grace is now. The reign of Jesus is now. Heaven invasion is now. It's not a someday thing. It's not a, I wonder when Jesus is coming back. He will come back in fullness, but his rule and reign is already established and it's rolling out now. Grace reigns now. At the center of it all, there is a lamb. not a roaring lion that wants to devour. Oh, don't, no, don't, don't, don't mistake. He's not stupid. He knew exactly what he was doing. Seven eyes, remember? And he's not weak. Don't mistake meekness for weakness. Don't mistake the fact that he laid his life down and he let sin take him and he let humanity take him. Don't mistake that as weakness. That was actually eternal, omnipotent strength. And it was part of the plan all along. The apocalypse has happened and is happening. The lamb is on the throne. The lamb is on the throne right now over coronavirus, over pandemics, over the economy, over your busted up family, over your disappointment, over your job search, over your body, over tomorrow, over the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next month and the next year, forever and ever and ever, the lamb is on the throne. That is the apocalypse. See the lamb. That's the invitation. The invitation of Revelation 5 and everything that flows from the rest of the book all is from that singular declaration. I saw a lamb. It's this claim that grace reigns. Grace reigns. Jesus has triumphed. Love has triumphed over hate, right? It's a lamb. He didn't conquer hate by hating it. He loved, he loved. Mercy has triumphed over judgment. Peace has triumphed over chaos. Life has triumphed over death. death. Kingdom has triumphed over the anti-kingdom. And Christ has and will continue to conquer over antichrists. As we're going to see, grace reigns. Breathe that in. The first Christians, I'm almost done. The first Christians, they would have seen that and they would have been like, oh, Jesus is on the throne. Grace is on the throne. Nero is not on the throne. Domitian is not on the throne. Persecution is not on the throne. Death is not on the throne. Jesus is on the throne. Grace is on the throne. Through the grace of God, through Jesus, grace is reigning. No matter what you see, the invitation is to look at the Lamb. 
is to look at the lamb. Romans chapter 5 tells us that just as sin reigned in death, so grace might reign through the righteousness, through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What does it mean? What does it mean to live under the reign of grace? I just, I just jotted down some thoughts for you today to take, to take home. What does it mean to live under the reign of grace, under the revelation? This is an invitation to live under the revelation, the constant awareness that Jesus rules and reigns. Grace rules and reigns. Well, you're invited to see the lamb when whatever, when you see yourself. Sometimes you need to see the lamb before you think about yourself. You need to remember that, you know what? You aren't the sum of your mistakes. You aren't what people did to you. You aren't the, the disappointments that you had. You are, the Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. The lamb's on the throne. Grace rules. So that means grace rules over me. It also tells me that grace rules over my sinfulness. Grace rules in such a way that it makes sin matter more, not less. See the lamb when you see your past. Remember that although your sins are as scarlet, they are washed as white as snow, it says in Isaiah. See the lamb when you see your present. Are you suffering right now? See the lamb. See the one who is acquainted with sorrow. See the one who knows what it is to suffer. See the one who would cause you to pray a prayer like, like Paul who said, I want to know Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings because it's actually in suffering that triumph begins to happen. This lamb rules through suffering. See the lamb when you see your future. Who can separate us from the love of God? The lamb should remind you that it's going to be okay. The lamb should remind you that, look, Jesus is on the throne. And it doesn't really matter what I go through today or tomorrow. In the end, he will have his way. He is the one who is worthy to hold the scroll. He is the one who is exacting my future. He is the one who is rolling it out. See the lamb when you see others. Let grace rule when you see others. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, we don't see people from a worldly point of view. We see people from a revelation, from an apocalyptic point of view. We see the lamb when we see others. See the lamb when you see the world. See the mission of the world. See that the lamb is wanting to exact his rule and his plan and his will across the earth and see it prophetically that we believe that he will reign from sea to sea and he will have dominion from the river to the end of the earth. Can I get an amen? See the lamb. See the lamb when you see God. I think that's one of the most important things about this is like at the most climactic moment in the Bible when the camera zooms in on what is God really like? You see a lamb that was slain. Even later, you're going to see Jesus come back and it says that he rides a white horse. We're going to see a couple white horses. They're pretty wild. But Jesus comes back and it gives us this image of him conquering and he's got the, the, he conquers by the sword of his mouth, which is the representation of his word. But then it says he's covered in blood. And some people have taken that to mean that it's like the blood of his enemies. I don't think it is. I think it's his blood. Because if grace rules and he conquers through laying himself down, I don't think he's going to change the game at any point. I mean, of course, we're going to see him do away with sin and death forever and ever. But this God, what is he like? He's like a lamb who is slain. The lamb is on the throne. Here's three questions, three reflection questions for you, and then I'm going to pray. Question number one, am I, keeping, am I keeping the scroll? Am I keeping the will of God in full view this season of my life? Or am I living like it's been dropped? Do you believe that God has your life in his hand? Number two, when I see, when I think of God, do I see a lamb who was slain standing a seven-horned, all-powerful seven-eyed, all-knowing lamb, God, who is standing, it says, not laying down, standing in authority. When I think of God, when I conceive of God, do I see the lamb? Has the apocalypse of Jesus transformed your vision of what you think or who you think God is? Do you see God? Do you think of God as a lamb whose mercy beckons us? Or are you trying to get him off your back? Do you think he's angry? 
Number three, am I operating under the reign of grace? That's the big question. Am I operating under the reign of grace with myself? Are you holding yourself accountable for things that the Ancient of Days has forgiven you for? Are you punishing yourself things, for things that Jesus bore for you? Am I operating under the reign of grace with myself, with others, with the world? The apocalypse is happening now. Grace rules. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you that right now there is a lamb who sits on the throne. And we breathe in that peace, that security, that prosperity, that provision, the assurance that everything that happens, Lord, you command our days, you command our destinies, that you cause all things to come together for the good of those who love you and have been called according to your good, gracious, awesome, powerful purposes. We thank you that there's nothing that can separate us from your love. Height, depth, angels, demons, persecution, nakedness, sword, famine, death itself cannot separate us from your love. And so Father, over every person under the sound of my voice today, I pray that the peace of God that comes as a byproduct of the grace of God would reign in every heart and mind, that it would flush out anxiety. It would flush out poverty and scarcity. And it would absolutely overwhelm them with the most incredible peace that comes from the revelation that says, if God is for us, if there's a lamb on the throne, who can be against us? We thank you for this truth in Jesus' name. Help us live under it.